In this video I would like to talk a little bit about the effect you can have by how you live your life and what happens to you after death. So um, we all live for different amounts of time and uh, we're not judged by um, in a way what we have done or haven't done because that would be a little bit unfair to a person who dies very young compared to a person who dies at the ripe old age. We are judged more um, on a level of how much we use our opportunities. And judged, you may ask, who is judging us? Well, on this planet we have karma. And fortunately, besides karma, we also have a kind of divine mercy. So, first of all, let me explain a little bit how karma works. So, karma is not so much a person who decides what is right and what is wrong, but it is very much about um, how well are you capable uh, to use the things you have. And if you are utilizing all your tools, well, then obviously you should have them because you're making use of them. And if you're allowing your tools to rust, uh, well, then there's no point in you having them is there. <laughs> so we might as well rid you of that burden. So karma is about, in a way, finding for you something which is fitting. And if a person is, in a way, um, constantly um, yeah, moving their, li their limits, their boundaries, and they're really growing, expanding, uh, beyond what their typical comfort zone is, then in a way their karma improves. They will be granted more possibilities after death or in their next incarnation. And the opposite is also true. If a person learns a little and then is then confident and doesn't really develop up to the level of um, his potential or his talent, well, then there's no reason for him to have more than that. Uh, so in his next incarnation, his talent will become, um, yeah, diminished. So it is very much about how active we are, uh, how ambitious we are, and how much we make of, yeah, um, what we're what we're given, uh, both as natural talents, but also out of opportunities we are presented. And as humans, we are horrible at utilizing our opportunities. Because often the first time an opportunity comes along, we don't even recognize that there has been an opportunity for some great step or, uh, forward. Because it's the first time we've seen something like that. We don't know that something like that can happen to us even. So we fail to recognize these opportunities and that's okay. That's ha what happens to everybody. And, but usually the second or the third time an opportunity comes along, then somehow an inkling comes like, gosh, if I would have done that, that may have been smart or may have been wiser, or may have changed something or led somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but uh, Maybe I should give it a try. And usually the fourth or the fifth time an opportunity comes along, then it is expected of us that we do something with it. And of course, not everybody does. Some people are held back by laziness, doubt, fear, or other things. And eventually those opportunities become fewer and far in between because the other forces which want us to learn eventually become demotivated and will yeah, try less. So we are in a way determining um, the speed of our development by also motivating the powers around us. And if we are in a way motivated about our self-development, they are also motivated and then we can cooperate in this process. Otherwise, it is like, uh, yeah, for them trying to push, uh, roll the rock uphill, and at the moment they stop pushing, you roll back down the hill. Uh, so this is, you could say, the more negative or the heavier karma. Karma isn't only about using opportunities, it is also about building habits. 
and identifying with a certain role or a certain position in life. And um, there are several caste systems, like the, the Japanese have a caste system, the Europeans have a caste system, um, Native Americans have a caste system, um, Indians have a caste system. And these are also ways to, in a way, mirror your, uh, your powers, your talents, and also how they should be used. And with every caste comes, in a way, a responsibility to use certain talents. And as the, in a way, you get into a higher caste, that means that you should use more talents. Um, so it is not so much of a, of a real social stratification from a karmatic point of view, um, but it does tell you um, what is expected of you um, if you are of that caste or identify with that caste. Of course, many people identify with a caste which is in a way inappropriate for them because people tend to have a, a skewed view of themselves. They tend to view of them as less or uh, more than they really are. And it often leads to problems, but we should try to have a realistic view of our capabilities and our possibilities and try to do, develop up to that level. Uh, this development also goes in several stages. So the first stage is basically a stage of exploration. You have to find out what you're good at, what you like, what comes natural to you, what feels right, what feels wrong. Um, so this is a very playful stage where, in a way, you're just trying to get to know yourself. And once you have yeah, determined, in a way, what is your talent and your power and therefore your potential use for others, uh, then you get into the phase of manifesting that, of trying to use your talent, your power, your skill, uh, your experiences and build up and try to both grow yourself, your own ability, but also to manifest your power outward to affect the world around you. So after that phase, <coughs> there comes a phase of, in a way, um, refinement. So in the beginning it is about just doing much and getting out there, doing the work. And then you get into a stage where you want to develop a certain mastery, a certain finesse, a certain higher understanding of uh, what you're doing. So you're evolving in a way from a doer more to a philosopher or teacher or guide for others or following a similar path. And ultimately, um, you become in a way too old and too decrepit to do even that. And then you start preparing for your next incarnation and this preparation phase is often in a way refining what do you want to take with you, what do you want to let go of. Of course not everybody manages to yeah, live through all the four stages, but that's okay. Because the stages which you haven't lived in your current incarnation, uh, you tend to catch up with after your death. So if I'm still, in a way, in a phase of exploring uh, when I die, but I haven't gotten around to the stage of trying to use my powers, often I will not incarnate, but my spirit will then fulfill that phase without a body. And for instance, if I want to be a healer, but I die very young, then my spirit will become a healing spirit and I will start to heal people while being a spirit, instead of while being possibly a doctor or a nurse or something like that, or masseur. Same goes for all the other phase, phases. If you die while you're still applying the power, but haven't gotten to the teacher state yet, well, after you die, you will learn, you will grow, and eventually you will become a teacher spirit. And you will get through that phase while not having a body. And yeah, the same if you're a teacher but haven't really 
prepared to let go, well, then you'll get in the phase of letting go. So often when a spirit um, has a very set goal or a very set path, they can fulfill it even though their body dies. So this is also very important to realize that the death of the body is, yes, it is frustrating because it is easier to do some things while you have a body, but it doesn't stop you. If your spirit wants to do something, it will do that, with or without the body. The other part I want to um, get into is in a way the um, attachments we make. Um, because, as I said, like some people are in a way more um, focused on a group, others are more focused on themselves, and some are more focused on a specific task. Um, and these attachments also determine in a way what you will be connected to after you leave your body. If you're a person who's in a way a loner and you're just traveling through the cosmos gathering knowledge and experiences, well then you will continue that journey alone or with other wanderers who are doing a similar thing. If you're identifying with a, a larger whole and you see yourself as being part of that whole, like I'm uh, a part of the earth for instance, or you can be uh, identifying with a specific role like I'm a healer so I'm one of a, of a group of healing spirits or spirits of wisdom if you're a teacher um, then you will become part of that group again you will kind of dissolve into the collective and then when it is time to be reborn you will crystallize a new personality which is fitting that time and place in which you want to manifest yourself you could also have a much more personal attachment to a specific god or goddess or uh, a master or an angel and um, or a spirit group and you can enter into service of that higher being or higher power and that means that after death this higher power just as you served it while incarnated they will help you and serve you after you leave your body. Um, so this is also a very um, interesting process by which you can, um, in a way, through your life, invest in having help in the afterlife. So by serving um, this higher power, it is kind of a deal, like you serve them in life, they serve you in the afterlife, or the other way around, you get them to serve you while you're alive and you have to serve others while you are not incarnated. So this is kind of a um, changing places which happens between life and death. Building these kind of um, connections, they have yeah, pros and cons. The pro is of course that you have somebody who is going to help you as you cross over. Crossing over is yeah, both um, disorienting and also a little bit dangerous even. So it is good to have this ally to help you with these uh, difficult transitions. But you yeah, in a way are trading a freedom for security, just as in the physical world. So think for yourself what would be the yeah, appropriate way to live your life.